For Pacifica Radio, June the 20th, 2024, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. All right, y'all, welcome to the show. It is Anti-War Radio. I'm your host, Scott Horton. I'm the editorial director of Antiwar.com, and I'm the author of the book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. You can find my full interview archive, more than 6,000 of them now, going back to 2003, at scotthorton.org and at youtube.com slash scotthortonshow and all your podcatchers and video sites and so forth. Just look for The Scott Horton Show. And, uh, of course, I'm here every Thursday from 2.30 to 3 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. All right, and our guest today is the great Ted Snyder. He writes for us at the Institute and at Antiwar.com. Really great stuff. Uh, lately, almost entirely focusing on Eastern European issues. Welcome back to the show, Ted. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Scott. Thanks a lot for asking. It's, it's great to be on the show with you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Uh, great to have you on the show here. And great to read your articles. You're uh, paying very close attention to all this stuff while I'm writing my history book. You're mm. keeping tabs on all the current stuff for me. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I actually have the tab open here, of course, but I haven't gotten to it yet. The New York Times finally put out a bunch of papers from the negotiations at the very beginning of the Ukraine-Russia war in 2022. This is very famous now. We've been compiling all the various evidences and leaks and confirmation about just how close or mm-hmm. far apart mm-hmm. uh, Ukraine and Russia were before America and Britain put the kibosh on the negotiations mm-hmm. and said they wanted to fight. That's a paraphrase, but there's a lot of various evidences for that. So now mm-hmm. Vladimir Putin has said, I propose peace along the lines of you surrendering uh, where the lines are now, or even in fact, maybe even a little more than that. And so on that occasion, it seems like the New York Times went ahead and put this story out. That was your conclusion that you come to in your article, that the New York Times story was sort of an answer to Putin's offer of calling it time out where things stand. It was it was striking to me, Scott, because the the West has been very publicly has been very skeptical about even the existence of this draft agreement or what's called the Istanbul communique. And and in fact, there's been Western officials that have gone so far as to mock Putin when he when he held up the document at a, at a conference of African leaders and said, you know, if, if Putin has the document, why doesn't he publish it? And they've been very, very, very skeptical about even its existence. And then Putin comes out and he offers a peace proposal. And, and his peace proposal is based on four points. The most important one, it's always been the most important one, is that Ukraine has to not be a NATO member. The second is that Ukraine has to withdraw from the four territories that Russia has, has annexed. The third is that they have to limit the size of their armed forces. And the fourth is that to guarantee the rights of Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Fine. That's really nothing different than Putin said all along. What seems to have riled the New York Times is, is when Putin said that the parameters of this proposal um, should be doable because they were all agreed upon in Istanbul in 2022, that everything was agreed upon. Suddenly now, the New York Times can produce these documents, which, by the way, it's clear from their own writing that they've had for months and months and months, um, because they say that they've been interviewing and stuff like that for, for a number of months. But suddenly they can produce it, and they produce it um, Sometimes I to- wonder, Ted, if the New York Times is really even in that big office building in New York City <laughs> or whether they're really just an office of the State Department. Yeah. Well, you know, others others have published it, but but the New York Times hasn't. And then suddenly they do. But, Scott, they don't publish it, you know, in support of Putin saying, look, there was this agreement. Instead, they focus on the differences and say that the negotiations, quote, fizzled. They say that they that they that they failed, that there were points of disagreement, that they clashed over issues. And they've got all this focus that that Putin's full of it because he wants to base on this terms that were agreed. They were never agreed. They were a mile apart. In fact, the documentary evidence is that they were really close. And a number of Ukrainian officials who are actually present um, have said that was 90 percent agreed upon. Um, that that we managed a very real compromise. We were very close to a peaceful settlement. I mean, they were really close. 
And then, and then remarkably, Scott, and this is right in the Istanbul communique. And keep in mind, by the way, let me just clarify for, for the listeners. The, the, the draft agreement that was signed by the Russian and Ukraine negotiating teams was based on this Istanbul communique, which summarized agreements, and it was written by the Ukrainian officials, okay? So this is not Russian stuff, okay? The, the Russians pro- wrote the, the draft proposal, but it's based on this, this Ukrainian-authored Istanbul communique. And remarkably, it's got the final point of the communique states, and I'm quoting, the parties consider it possible to hold a meeting sometime in 2022 between the president of Ukraine and Russia with the aim of signing an agreement and or making political decisions regarding the remaining unresolved issues. So there were unresolved issues. They hadn't agreed on territory. They hadn't agreed on the size of the caps. They'd agreed there would be territorial changes, but hadn't agreed on what exactly they were. They'd agreed the military in Ukraine would be capped, but hadn't agreed on exactly what they were. So there were there were things like that. But But they thought it was possible that Zelensky and Putin could meet after to quote resolve those remaining issues. So despite this closeness, the, the Times instead focuses on um, that, that Putin's baseness on these agreements that didn't exist, when clearly they did exist. So this seems to be a New York Times attempt to undercut Putin's claim that um, if people stopped interfering and blocking it, Ukraine and Russia really could arrive at an agreement. Yeah. Now, One thing that they say was outstanding was the security guarantees Yeah, that Ukraine wasn't going to sign on to this unless they had a promise from Russia, which to the Ukrainians obviously ain't worth much. But they wanted promises from America and all of our Western allies, too, that we would give them essentially some kind of de facto NATO membership. Was that really necessary or could they have been made to climb down from that or... That sounds like a hell of a sticking point, Ted. It is. It, it's a complicated point, and I think there's there's a ton we could say about this. It depends where you want to where you want to go first. The security guarantees were one of those items that were in principle agreed upon. They agreed there would need to be security guarantees, but the details were not yet agreed upon. There were a couple of models out there. The one they seemed to have settled on was that a number of countries would be guarantors that if Ukraine was attacked by Russia again, that they would in some way. Um, come to Ukraine's defense. Now, whether Russia would be one of those guarantors, which would mean they could veto it happening or whether they wouldn't was part of the sticking point. I think the thing that's important here, though, Scott, this is, this is, I think, I mean, given what's happened the last few years, this was really important. They had in principle agreed that there'd be security guarantees. They were arguing about the details. But had the West picked this up and encouraged negotiations, which they clearly did not, instead of blocking them, then then progress could have been made. Look, parties always come to the negotiating table with maximalist positions. Of course, Ukraine's going to go to their extreme and Russia's going to go to their extreme. And the whole art of diplomacy negotiations is, as the text said, finding compromises. Right. Um, so, so the West could have encouraged this. Instead, they squashed it. And we All right, now hold, more- hold that thought one second here. It's yeah. Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Ted Snyder from Antiwar.com. And we're talking about the New York Times story about the negotiations, what could have been two years ago. And so if you could really drill down and focus on this particular point for the audience here, Ted, what exactly do we know about America and Britain's take on Ukraine and Russia's negotiations at that time? And what difference does it make? So it was really clear that the decision had been made both in, in the West and in NATO not to support negotiations, at least until Russia had completely withdrawn from Ukraine. They, the, the West had made the decision not to support the negotiations. Beyond that, they had actively interfered. So Boris Johnson famously shows up. We were talking about security guarantees a moment ago. Boris Johnson famously shows up in Kiev and threatens Zelensky, you can sign whatever security guarantees you want. We're not going to. Um, the West didn't want to sign these security guarantees. They didn't want to get drawn into war with Russia. They weren't. They weren't. You know, they weren't going to do this. And they, they, they told, they told Zelensky, "You can sign guarantees. We're not going to talk to Putin. Um, just go fight Putin, and we'll give you whatever you need for as long as you need." We know from several people who were involved in the talks, um, including, including two or three Ukrainian officials who were involved in the talks. Um, sorry, not two or three, one or two, two or three is a different concept, one or two Ukraine officials who said 
that the West interfere with the talks. Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister who was involved in the talks, said that the West blocked it. Um, the, the former German chancellor, Schroeder, um, also said that, the, that Ukraine had to check everything with the states and the states blocked it. The Turkish officials who were at the Istanbul conference said that the West blocked it. There's all kinds of evidence that the West blocked it. One of the interesting things, Scott, that struck me about the New York Times piece is in trying to be dismissive of this idea that the West blocked it, they, they maybe inadvertently introduced two new pieces of evidence that I had never seen before um, that the West blocked it. One of them was the U.S., where, where the Times quotes U.S. officials as rather patronizingly saying to the Ukrainians who had agreed to the terms um, that they were alarm, alarmed by the terms and wanted to know if Ukraine understood, very patronizing, that this was just unilateral disarmament and we're talking them out of it. That's interesting. But the one that was really interesting to me, Scott, is that we've heard of the U.S. and the U.K. blocking negotiations. The Times introduces for the first time this idea that Poland did also. I'd never seen it widened beyond um, the states in Britain before. And, and they say that that um, Polish officials, this is actually an interesting quote, so I, I want to read it the way it actually says it, that Poland feared that Germany or France might try to persuade the Ukrainians to accept Russia's terms. So, so Poland was afraid that there'd be European pressure to support the negotiations instead of the US and UK who were blocking negotiations. And so the Polish president held up the negotiated text to the NATO leaders and said, you know, which one of you would sign this to try to, to try to talk them out of it. So this is also Poland actively discouraging NATO um, to, to support the negotiations. So the New York Times actually adds evidence to the idea that the West, um, rather than encouraging and supporting negotiations, which were not finished, but promising, um, blocked them. So that was kind of a staggering piece of the Times article for me. Yeah, indeed. All right. Now, one thing I saw, I guess, a headline that came out of the New York Times story was the spin on it was, can you believe the Russians were trying to nitpick over street signs and stuff? Yeah. It just goes to show how completely crazy they are or worse that this was just a pretext that yeah. they just wanted to resupply their forces or something and, you know, cause a delay. But no serious negotiation would include street signs in someone else's country, Ted. Come on. Yeah, this was this was presented in the Western media as, you know, petty Russian interference in, you know, Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian race, stuff like that. That's not the way it was worded at all. I mean, uh, I mean, what, what Putin said is they must ensure the rights of the Russian-speaking citizens of Ukraine. Um, he wasn't talking about just the renaming of street signs. He was talking about um, street signs that are glorifying um, ultra-nationalist, you know, historical figures in Ukraine that, that, for example, collaborated with the Nazis and things like that. This, this was not just like, we'll tell you how to name your streets. This was a request to stop glorifying ultra-nationalists who had... Um, participated on the en masse killing of Russians, Poles, and Jews. Um, so, so this was not a petty, um, we'll tell you how to name your streets. This was a request to stop glorifying um, Ukraine's ultranational past, which, which for Russia isn't the past, because it's still very much the present in the Donbass, where Russian speakings feel this, um, this idea in Ukraine that, that, that the true Ukraine can't involve two cultures, but must be, you know, monocultural and have to completely squash Russian language, Russian church, Russian media, Russian literature, Russian culture. Um, so this, this was Putin's request to protect the rights of, of Russian speaking Ukrainians. It wasn't some petty thing about, about street signs. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is renaming all the streets after these guys and building statues to them, Stepan Bandera and the others yeah. from the OUN. This has yeah. been a major agenda of the far right in Ukraine over the last yeah. 20 years. And so it's not a matter of that's how it's been all along. And now these kooks want to come change all the signs. These were relatively new changes and they were made, as you're saying, as part of this agenda to force this far western culture onto the rest of the society there this is, it's this a is big country a, it's the size of texas which is big it, it, this is a feature of the the administrations that came to power after the 2014 coup 
that saw it as part of the agenda to make Ukraine not a multicultural society, but a, but a monocultural society, that they had to erase everything that was Russian and, and glorify that, that, to some extent, that nationalist past. But this erasure of everything that's Russian is part of Putin's point that, that the war, he argues, did not start a couple of years ago with, with an invasion of Ukraine. It started with a civil war where the sort of um, mono culture Ukraine was waging war and, you know, erasing, waging war on the Donbass and erasing Russian culture in the Donbass um, at, that sees this war as in part a protection of that. Of course, in large part is to stay out of NATO, but the two are connected because, because Putin's enormous fear is that Ukraine could join NATO and then attack Crimea or Donbass and Russia would suddenly find itself at war, not with Ukraine, but with NATO. That's that's Putin's huge fear. So right. this is what this is what this is all about. So those points are seriously connected. So point number one about not being a NATO, and point number two about assuring the rights of Russian-speaking Ukrainians, um, they're not radically different points. Right. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Robertson Roberts Brokerage Inc. Nobody trusts the U.S. dollar anymore. Foreign governments are stocking up on gold instead of hundred-dollar bills. One, they know they need to, and two. That means you need to, too. Interest rates are up, but for some reason, not much for savings accounts. Park your money there and watch Uncle Joe Biden just counterfeit its value away. You can see how the Fed is afraid to raise rates to beat inflation for fear of popping the current bubbles, at least before the election. So more inflation it will continue to be. Gold is your shield against monetary and price inflation, just like it always has been. Now Tim Fry and the guys over at Roberts & Roberts are recommending gold over silver since the world's almost 200 governments are putting their own pressure on the price, which should help everyone else who makes similar calls on their own. Of course, Roberts and Roberts can help you with platinum, palladium, and silver as well as gold. Don't let the Fed and the war party inflate all your savings away. Look up Roberts and Roberts at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's scotthortonshow.substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? scotthortonshow.substack.com. Hey, y'all, libertasbella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. Hey, y'all got kids or nephews or anything? You know about the Tuttle Twins books, right? Libertarian lessons about life, liberty, truth, and the state. It's really great stuff. And hey, did you guys know I'm a Tuttle Twin? Or, well, I'm a character in their world now. Skater Scott, local vert dog and anti-government know-it-all. They introduced me in a short book last year, and I hear they're going to develop my character's story a bit more in the future. Cool, right? Anyway, they're now celebrating 10 years and having sold millions of these books. And now they're giving away a free magazine at TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years. There's no shipping charge and they're not going to ask for your credit card. It's just a free magazine. The gimmick is that inside the magazine, they've got a really great deal to get all the books. The best deal they've ever offered, which you will certainly want to take them up on. So go to TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years for your free magazine. And someday, hopefully soon... You and your kids will be reading all about the libertarian antics of cartoon me, along with all my new pals. That's TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years. All right, it's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Ted Snyder from Antiwar.com about the Russia-Ukraine war, well, and the politics of the whole dang thing here. Um, so an important uh, part of it is, uh, and you wrote a whole article about this for Antiwar.com, about uh, Joe Biden's interview with Time Magazine. and. Mm-hmm. Of course, the question of Ukraine in NATO came yeah. up there, and I know there are some other points too, and I want to hear you talk about all of those. But this point, yeah. where you know, and in fact, you have a whole other article like this too about how America will die. Well, no, America will get a bunch of Ukrainians killed for the sacred principle of their right to want to join NATO. 
However, we're never going to let them in because that would mean war with Russia. What are you, crazy? If we're not willing to put our troops in there to defend them right now, then why would we be willing to put our troops in there to defend them after we signed a piece of paper with them? Might as well not yeah. sign a piece of paper with them, right? We've already proven comes down to it. We're not going to nuclear war over Ukraine. So why bring them into NATO? But then if we're not going to bring them into NATO, why all the fussing and feuding in the first place there, Ted? Yeah, and Scott, we could talk, I mean, if we had more time, we could talk a lot about whether Ukraine just has the right to join NATO, because it's not so clear that, that countries just have the right to choose their alliances. And But but the thing about the time article, the time interview, Scott, and I'd love to know your take on this, because I just don't know what to make of it. The, the article was, it was concerning to me because of the extent that Biden, it seemed, at times seemed like confused or misinformed and sometimes just dead off message. And the most off message he seemed to have gotten was on this question of um, of, uh, of of Ukraine in NATO, because the the last question that that um, he was asked was was how the end game looked um, in Ukraine. And he really strangely says that that the end game um, doesn't mean NATO. No, just just to say your your listeners know, I'm not just pulling this out of a hat. The the last que- the, the, the the question to Biden was, um, what's the end game? And Biden seems to answer that the end game is not Ukraine and NATO. So he says, and I'm quoting, he said, it means we have a relationship with them like we do with other countries, where we supply weapons so they can defend themselves in the future. But that relationship, Biden goes on to say, quote, does not mean NATO. And then he goes on to kind of strangely explain, I was the one, the one that I was saying that I'm not prepared to support the NATOization of Ukraine. Now, right. he may have been talking about the past there where he says, I've never supported the NATOization of Ukraine. But talking about the present, he defines the security relationship with Ukraine as us supplying them weapons so they can defend themselves. But that doesn't mean NATO. So here's Biden, unless I'm reading it wrong, just totally off message, telling Time magazine straight up the end game for Ukraine doesn't involve NATO. Well, I mean, it's consistent, though. I mean, he's right. that If you go back for two and a half years, he did say that we're not going to bring Ukraine into NATO, not any time in, like, say, the next 10 years or something. He just wasn't willing to sit down at a table and put it in writing. That was all. But he, he he acknowledged that it would make no sense because of they don't really have a democracy. They don't really have anything like a free market. The country's so corrupt and they're completely divided on these East West type issues. And that's what they've been saying for 30 years. Well, we can't bring Ukraine into NATO because of all these reasons. And he was basically saying that on the eve of war. And he just wasn't willing to actually shake on it you know and and this and this, and, and you're right i mean you can't ukraine can't join nato because a country who is either at war or has or who has contested territory can't join nato but but the but the promise since 2008 has been that that the promise was that ukraine would eventually join nato and that the state department kept saying this war is being fought to defend the core principle right. that countries can choose their alliances. Well, and in the fall and, of 21, the State and Defense Departments both put out big presentations about, I, on the State Department side, that we're committed to doing this <clears throat> someday. Yeah. Which is, what's the point of that, other than a provocation? And then the Defense Department announced that they were doing more on interoperability and arming and et cetera. So... In yeah, both in cases, provocations, language. but without the actual war guarantee that would serve as the deterrent. Right. And, and the latest language is that we are creating a pathway to Ukrainian membership in NATO, but we're not prepared to advance them along that pathway, which is what they said recently. But, it's but amazing. You, you have to square this. Like, you've got to square that the states will say we are fighting this war for NATO's open door policy. We're fighting this war for the right for NATO to join Ukraine. Well, saying that it'll happen one day, but never offering a timeline. But this is Biden saying straight out in The New York Times, it doesn't mean NATO. That's the end game. The end game's not NATO. Um, that that would be something that would sit very hard in Ukraine to to believe that they're fighting this war, you know. Um, they should take that them. to heart. They should know right yeah. now that that was, even if he accidentally said it, that was the truth. Yeah, we're really was, that, not that was, willing to have them in our alliance. And quite frankly, I think that the Estonians ought to wonder whether we're coming for them. 
and the polls too. And I would suggest that we're not. Yeah. And so they ought to focus on good relations with Russia so that it doesn't become an issue. Yeah. And it was a, it was it just struck me as a staggeringly off message thing for Biden. And one one wonders a little bit <laughs> about about Biden in that interview. Well, I mean, and you know what? So let's talk about another couple of the points that he made in there. We're short on yeah. time here, Ted, but it's Ted Snyder from antiwar.com. And we're talking about crazy old Joe Biden. He also had said to Time magazine. Yeah, but you just don't understand. We've completely yeah. destroyed the Russian military. Yeah. Is that right? And also, you quote him talking about, you got to understand, Putin himself said he wants to recreate the whole USSR. Yeah. And I'm so thinking, got- look, I know that that's a stupid lie and everything, but that's his stupid lie, right? Don't tell me that he really thinks that. Your uh, inference is that he really thinks that that's right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I know we're running out of time, so let me try to answer them like super quick that the, the, the Russian army one, like we can do in just like two quotations, Biden said, and he's angry at the times interviews, you're skipping over everything that's important. He says, quote, the Russian military has been decimated. You don't write about that. It's been freaking decimated. Um, so that's not true. The Russian army. He said freaking, huh? Yeah. He said, it's been freaking decimated. That's the way that that time wrote it anyway. But just like to counter that, I just, I just want to um, quickly quote um, General Christopher Cavalli. Um, He's the commander of U.S. European Command, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. And, and his report on whether that Russian army has been decimated is, and I'm quoting, the Russian army is now larger by 15 percent than it was when it invaded Ukraine. It's growing by 30,000 soldiers a month. And then he added that Russia's on track to command the largest military on the content continent. So no, it, it hasn't been it hasn't been decimated. Um, the second one you talked about was Biden mocking the Times interviewers that they just don't understand that Putin wants to reestablish the Soviet Union. And he keeps pulling out this this Putin speech from February 2022, and he and he's mocking them. He says, "You probably haven't read it. I know you haven't read this." And he goes on to. To say, he says, to quote Putin saying he's going to reestablish the Soviet um, empire. The the thing about it, though, Scott, is two things. One, um, he very selectively quotes. He 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 puts in um, he puts in some of the lines, and then he completely leaves out other of the lines. And he says, for example, that that um, Ukraine's not just a neighboring country; it's an it's an inalienable it's an inalienable part of our history, our cultural, spiritual space. And he uses this as evidence that he's saying Ukraine's part of Russia. But the next line, which Biden doesn't quote, is that these are our comrades, those dearest to us, not only colleagues, friends, and people who serve together, but relatives, people bound by blood, family ties. He's not quoting the closeness of the of the Ukrainian people to say he's going to integrate or conquer them. He's quoting the closeness of the people at Donbass to say he's going to protect them. And nowhere in the speech, in his edited version or the full speech, nowhere does Putin even talk about going beyond Ukraine, reestablishing the Soviet Union. So this speech that Biden's holding up, which, by the way, the speech of Putin's that he's holding up is extremely critical of the Soviet Union. But this speech that he's holding up is proof that Biden said he's going to reestablish the Soviet empire. It never even mentions that. It doesn't even hint at it. And, and it's, he quotes it tremendously out of context. He cherry picks lines. And even those lines don't say he's going to reestablish the Soviet Union. And clearly he doesn't even want to take anything west of the Dnieper River. Scott, if he wanted to do that, he would have done it in Georgia in 2008. He would have done it in Ukraine in 2014. I mean, it's not like Putin hasn't had opportunities. Whenever he's committed his military, they've been with very limited goals. He didn't annex the the the, uh, Georgian provinces. He didn't conquer them when he could have. Um, well, you know, made- I mean, it is a government program. And let's say he wins and Zelensky gives him what he wants tomorrow. Well, now he's bordering a country that is now completely dominated by the Western nationalists with no counterbalance from the East that he's now absorbed and closer to NATO than before, more belligerent than before. And it might make sense in the slippery slope of solving the problem that you created by creating a worse one for him to go ahead or it might just lead inexorably to a war again against Western Ukraine in the aftermath of this in another 10 or 20 years, which would then, of course, put him right on NATO's borders further, right uh, on Poland and Romania. Go ahead. Yeah. 
He doesn't want to be on NATO's borders. That's what this whole war is about, is trying not to be on NATO's borders, for one thing, right? He doesn't want Ukraine and NATO because it would be NATO and Russia's borders. So he doesn't want to expand Russia west just to be on NATO's borders. That's what he's trying not to do, for one thing. For second thing, if he conquered Ukraine, he would have to control this massive hostile country. He'd be facing, you know, um, guerrilla warfare. He, he doesn't... He doesn't need or want that. And he stated very clearly recently that he's prepared to end the war now along the current along the current borders. He stated over and over again that the that the goal is not to expand further west. He's also warned that if the, the if that if the these terms aren't accepted this time, the rallies and ground make the terms harder in the future. But um, but the last statement Putin made is that he's prepared to end the war um, along the current administrative lines and and not go further west. And at the end of his most recent peace proposal, Putin said that if if Ukraine guarantees not being in NATO and withdraws from the four regions that Russia's annexed, he says immediately, I'm quoting, immediately, literally at that moment, an order will be given to cease fire and begin negotiations. So do you believe Putin? That's up to you. But do you explore that? <laughs> You'd be crazy not to. Yeah. No, I think that that's right. I mean, it's not like he's saying he's willing to compromise. He's just saying he's willing to call time out where the lines are now and plus a little bit. I mean, he's I take him at his word for that. I mean, it's not like he's feigning generosity. He's when, saying when Putin you know, says that when Putin says that my war goals have always been to keep Ukraine out of NATO, NATO out of Ukraine and protect the rights of ethnic Russians in the east. That's been validated. Like, I mean, do we have to completely accept it? No, we explore. But, you know, Zelensky has said that Russia went to war to keep Ukraine out of NATO. Um, the head of NATO has said Russia went to war with Ukraine to keep Ukraine out of NATO. I mean, it's not that we're just taking Putin at his word. Um, this is also the word of NATO and the Ukraine. So um, it's more than just Putin's word, and certainly it's something to explore. And when Putin talks about using the Istanbul communique as a basis, well, they were really close. Ukraine says they were 90% there, and the rest could be talked about between the two presidents. So why not pick it up and explore from there? You know, what do you right. what do you have to lose by, right. by encouraging negotiations instead of it's saying... It's the same with the treaty before the war. You know, Chas Freeman and other real experts, State Department lifelong diplomats said... No, you don't sign on the bottom line, of course. But is this a reasonable basis for negotiation? Absolutely. Yeah. They should have taken him up on it then. I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time on the show, Ted. Appreciate it. Thanks, God. It was great talking to you. All right, you guys. And that's Anti-War Radio for today. I'm Scott Horton. I'm at scotthorton.org. And I'm here every Thursday from 2.30 to 3 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. See you next week.